Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so it stands for Curriculum Open Resources and Economics. It, it was a kind of slightly forced acronym, but it, but it, it sounds quite nice as, as core. Can I just start by... Um, um, uh, I'm going to describe the core projects in a moment, but I, but I think to set this in context, there are, there are a few things which are very durable in education, which are the, the, the difficulty of motivating students. And, and we, we, we know that motivation is important in education, and we know that active learning is important, so getting them to do things. And that's not new. That didn't come with online education. We've known that for a very long time. We've also known that perhaps lectures are fairly outmoded as a, as a, as a form of pedagogy and you know, at least since Donald Bly's book in 1971 or whenever it was. And that, again, was long a long time before online education. And the other challenge that the core project, I think, deals with specifically is that another problem that we've had for, for many, many years is how do you get departments uh, and disciplines to update their courses, and by that I mean not necessarily delivery, but content. And, 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 and what I'm gonna try and describe to you is a project which I think um, enables content change to happen by moving things online. And I think it's that kind of complementarity that, that really lends, lends to, to, to its success. So let me just um, uh, introduce this by saying that this, this uh, it's an online, um, textbook if you like, but I think it's more than that, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about it uh, in, in a short while. But these are some of the universities that are using it, and, and it was produced by an international collaboration of about 25, 30 academics from around the world, so, so, so it's unique in that respect. It was a very openly produced um, uh, resource, and, it's a, and, and it is also an open educational resource in the sense that it, it, it's licensed by a Creative Commons license, so it, so it is it's, it's open to that that degree. It's not completely open in the sense that some people here have talked about co-creating and continuous creation, but nevertheless, it, it's, it's open in that, that degree. So I just quickly, um, the, the motivation for this, if I, if I um, uh, oh, right, just take you back to um, 2008, and you remember the financial crash when everyone started complaining about economists, <laughs> right? as well as uh, worrying about what was happening in the economy at the time. But around that time, there were a number of, especially in the UK, student groups um, rethinking economics. There was one called the Post-Crash Economic Society that started to complain about the fact that what they were learning didn't equip them with all the stuff that was happening around the world. And in fact, you may also remember that the Queen of England also complained about, <laughs> she said something like, well, why didn't they see it coming? And, 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 and uh, you know, d d d of course, it's not economists' job to necessarily predict in that sense, but there was a feeling that the content that we were teaching was problematic. Now, subjects like economics, and I don't know whether this is true across the board or not, but academics are very, um, uh, taken with the stuff that they teach. They don't like to let go of it. And in, in various conferences, when we were beginning the core project, um, what, uh, pe people kind of said to us, um, um, how can you put all this new stuff in? Because what are you going to leave out? And th there was that real challenge, and it's that challenge that I'm going to try and describe how we got around. Anyway, what is this word cloud? This is a word cloud that we do every year at the moment in, in a number of universities around the, world, uh, around the world, the ones that you've seen, where we ask students who are just about to start an economics course, um, I can't remember the precise question, but you know, what, what, what is uh, economics for you? you know, what, what do you think econom economists study, or what should they study? It's something around, around that. And, and in, in a sense, it's not surprising. You know, nothing here looks odd. If you, if you ask this question in October 2016, this is what you're going to get. And, and let me just show you also, um, you know, that's the Toulouse School of Economics, which is another one that's just come, come on board, board with this. And by the way, that group of universities is among the kind of so-called elite universities around, around the world. So these, in some sense, are the kind of tanker institutions that it's quite difficult to shift. I mean, I take Jeff's point that in many ways they're more autonomous as well, so maybe they're easier to shift. But um, that's Toulouse. Uh, it's slightly different, but unemployment is there, Trump is there, Brexit is there. Now, we did a word cloud of uh, a standard and well-used textbook as well of economics that's used traditionally. Uh, Mankiw, seventh edition, Principles of Economics, and there is no overlap, <laughs> you know. The, 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 what students think that they 
should learn in an economics course or what they will learn doesn't resonate with what's actually in the textbooks. And, and this is not an oddly chosen textbook. I mean, you, know, you could do this with virtually any textbook, and, and, and you know, I challenge you to find any, anything different. So um, the core project developed around trying to um, uh, fix certain, as we saw it, gaps. So there was a gap between, you see, the problem with 2008 was not that economists weren't studying inequality and, and information problems and, and, and all these sorts of real world things. It's that we weren't teaching them to our first year students in particular. And so CORE started as, a, as an attempt to close this gap between what we know and what we teach to students on the left hand side here uh, and what students wanted to learn and what we were actually teaching them in our courses. Um, and, and it came alongside, we took, the, it, it seemed that it wasn't, if you wanted to change the content, then why not also change the pedagogy as far as you could? Um, w w why didn't we try and develop some resources which were uh, aimed at active independent learning rather than the kind of what's sometimes called the jug and mug where you kind of pour knowledge into, into students' heads? Um, and, and why don't we make this open educational, uh, an open educational resource which makes full use of the web and related resources rather than re a restricted proprietary resource in the, in the form of uh, a textbook? So, so, so that's where we are, and, and, it, and I just want to just describe a little bit about the complementarity between the pedagogic aims and the content aims, because I think that's what online, moving online has meant, meant for us. Um, and um, the, 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 actually, by the way, before I do that, let me just show you some of, some of the kinds of things that are in this text. It's an online text. The, 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 uh, you can have a look at it. It's um, core-econ.org is, is the website. And, and you just register and, and have a look at it. But there are videos, for example. I mean, none of this is revolutionary. But, but there, are, there are videos, as you can see, on the left, top left there with, with quite famous economists like Thomas Piketty. Um, there are online diagrams where you kind of move across them. So again, nothing very sophisticated, but there's an interaction there. And as the diagram shifts, the explanation shifts, so you can see the thing being built up rather than, rather than just in its final stages. There are uh, in multiple choice questions, which give you, as you can see there, I've answered the wrong question. It's given me a cross, and it's got an explanation as to why the question is wrong there as well, so you, you can kind of develop your learning in that way. Um, and, and perhaps more importantly, what the online method, uh, what the online move, move enabled us to do was to separate things into a more modular format. Economics has typically been taught, and this was part of the problem that the students and, and the Queen were complaining about, in, in a very linear fashion, where you start with the theory in a quite an abstract fashion. You teach, um, you teach that theory in a state of pure abstraction, which, has, which, which abstracts away from all of the kind of real world uh, things, like the fact that firms set their own prices. I mean, we, don't teach, we didn't just teach that in the first year, by and large. Um, and, um, and, and then it builds up slowly. And by the time you get to the third year or master's level or PhD sometimes, you, you, you may actually start talking about some of the things that were in that word cloud. So we, we, we thought it would make sense to invert that. So in the first year, you start with those things. You start with the world and its complexity. You start with c climate change. You start with inequality. You start with the fact that there are informational problems. And that means you have to introduce concepts to deal with that complexity at quite a high level of sophistication because you're no longer starting from 2 plus 2 equals 4 and 4 plus 4 equals 8. You're starting at a high level of complexity. And then it means that you haven't really properly, in some sense, developed the tools um, from, from first principles. And that's where the modularity really helps. Because I, I'll go back to what I started with, that the initial problem that we've had to face for many, many decades is how do you motivate students? Well, one way to motivate students is to start with the problems that they're interested in, which are climate change, Brexit, and all those things. You introduce, you, you get them hooked, in a sense, in that way. You introduce topics which they don't fully understand at that stage, but they can use them in application. And then you provide um, a, a modular set of tools which instructors and students can then use in order to fill in the gaps. Now, of course, that's what we always wanted to do, which was to motivate students to do work in themselves. This, this was the kind of high ideal of independent university, of independent learning in many of our universities. Um, and so, um, it's, 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 
so, so that's kind of what I want to describe here is that what, what we do in this is nothing, nothing enormously revolutionary, but what it has enabled us to do is to effect a change in some of the most conservative institutions and one of the most conservative subjects actually in the world uh, by just kind of inverting teaching and taking it online and using the online delivery format to modularize the content. Um, so that it's now possible uh, to teach in a way that we'd wanted to teach all along. Um, but that, that's, really, um, that's really more or less all I wanted to say. The takeaway from this, I think, is just that um, uh, there, uh, if, um, it, if online learning is going to lend itself to uh, revolutionizing teaching, then I think um, one of the ways it can do that is to encourage self-directed study, and, and, and it actually uh, may achieve that in a way that traditional methods that don't. And the second, th the second thing I just want to add as a conclusion is that it's quite daunting for students, self-directed uh, self independent study. And so um, I, I think one shouldn't underestimate you know, the, the difficulties involved in supporting students when, when they do undertake this kind of self-directed self study. And what we found is some kind of rhythm between throwing students into this, um, getting them to work in their, own, in, the, in their own time, in their own space, and then moving back to a more traditional lecture kind of format actually works quite well. Um, we flip a lot of the lectures in Bristol uh, by using videos and, and we, we entrust students to look at this material and then we just talk about it. But every three or four lectures, we just go back to the traditional route. And that kind of rhythm between uncomfortableness and, 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 and comfort seems, seems to work quite well. And, and finally then, um, I just point again to the enormous challenge involved in taking your students and your tutors along with you when you're trying anything revolutionary like this. And that's probably the hardest thing to do. Thank you.